today we are happy to have Nathan Seibert from Institute for Advanced Study. Uh, Nathan was a professor at Weizmann Institute and at Rutgers University before joining the Institute in 1997. Uh, he has won uh, numerous prizes, too numerous to list them all, but uh, here are some. He was a um, Casa Fellow. He um, got the Danny Heinrich Prize of American Physical Society. He's a fellow of American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He's also a member of National Academy of, uh, of Sciences. And uh, most recently, he won uh, the Breakthrough Prize um, in fundamental studies. So he won these prizes for numerous contributions to our understanding of quantum field theories and uh, of string theory. Um, my first encounter with, um, with Nathan, uh, Nathan's work, was actually as a graduate student in 95. And uh, I was a student at Caltech, and I went around as a first year student uh, talking to other graduate students and asking them, what are they working on? And they told me, well, why, of course, we're working on cyberbiology. I said, cyberbiology? What's, what's that? And they told me, oh, this is this brand new way of thinking about supersymmetric quantum field theory. And, um, well, I think that um, there's no better way on um, measuring one's impact on, uh, on a field than by what young people are working on at a time. And uh, certainly Nathan, Nathan's impact on particle physics and string theory has been great. So um, he'll tell us today about um, where are we headed. Thank you. Thank you, Mina, for this nice and generous introduction. And I'm really flattered, and I feel like after such an introduction, I should just sit down because it will all be downhill from here. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be back at uh, Berkeley. I had many visits to this great department, and I feel giving this talk like bringing coal to Newcastle. There are people in the audience who know much more than me about the topics I'll be talking about. Now, there's a known rule about titles of talks or papers there's a question in the title, the answer is always no. <laughs> but what about this title? This is not a yes, no question. So what should we do about that? I'd like to propose, and this is the first time I've published this, a, an extension of the previous rule about titles. Then when it's not a yes, no question, the answer is always, I have no idea.
now we should look forward to how we can go beyond that. The good news is that a lot more data is going to come soon. I mentioned that the LHC started, has already resumed operation. It already has beam of 6.5 TV, and I understand that there is a group here doing spectacular work at the LHC. And it will start running and collecting data very soon. We'll have more data with higher energy and higher luminosity, so we'll know a lot more uh, about that energy range. There's also a lot of data that is coming from other places, all sorts of experiments, there are precision measurements, not accelerators, there are searches for dark matter. That would also be related to electroweak symmetry breaking, to physics at the TV range that will be explored at the LHC. And there's a whole wealth of information coming from experiments in cosmology. So, so I think it's quite clear that in a few years we'll be a lot smarter than we are today. And the time scale is literally a number of years. And so for people like me who have been in this field for decades, we're really eager for these next few years, see what will happen. So we ask ourselves, well, we, what will the LHC find? And of course, we don't know if we knew we didn't have to make the experiment, and, but we can anticipate. So in the next slides, I'll run through various options of what it could be, like a menu of possibilities, and I'll organize it by several different, according to several different criteria. So the first thing that can happen is that we find nothing new. The standard model will continue to work. There will be more data. We'll get better accuracy. The error bars will get smaller. We'll have more statistics. Airbus will get smaller, will be more confident, but no new surprise. That's one option. It's quite interesting, but in a way, it will be disappointing. We could also go beyond the standard model, and that will be seen either as discrepancies between the measurement and theoretical computation. Theoretical computation is getting better, measurements are getting better, and we'll be, we might or might not see a discrepancy, primarily in the Higgs. The Higgs will be explored more accurately. But there could also be discrepancies in other processes. And more dramatically, we could find new particles, new resonances, new particles that are not present in the standard model. So in that case, we'll have to extend the standard model. It's working very well, but we'll need to extend it. And I'll organize the extensions of the standard model according to two different criteria. First, what will be discovered? What kind of new particles will be discovered? And we can organize that according to their spin. So one possibility would be additional scalars, and I put in parentheses theoretical models that people thought about. The Higgs at the moment is a single Higgs. This is the most minimal model. But people contemplated more, com more complicated examples, for example, two Higgs doublet models. Perhaps we'll find another Higgs particle. That would be quite exciting. Going to spin a half, we can find additional fermions. Possibility that has been studied at length is various massive vector-like particles, like a quark and an anti-quark or various heavy leptons. That's also possible. We can go to spin one, new gauge interactions. Popular set of models are known as Z prime models. Just as we have a Z, there's another Z-like particle called Z prime. So this is spin one. There could also be spin three half and so forth. So that would be what will be discovered, a new particle. And then we, the theorists, will have to put this particle, uh, this extension of the standard model in a deeper conceptual framework. So what are the various conceptual frameworks that we can find? So that we'll be told about these particles, and there could be different, and we, I'll classify them according to three different classes, three categories. The first, supersymmetry, and I'll say a lot more about them later in the talk. Supersymmetry, this is a weakly coupled theory, very popular, many people study it. It might or might not be discovered. The second option comes under various names where it's strong coupling, so in the first one, we have weak coupling. In the second one, we have, why doesn't it work? Okay, now it works. The second one, we have strong coupling. And with strong coupling comes in the name of technicolor, warped texture dimensions. All of them are essentially the same. So these are the two conceptual frameworks that have been entertained theoretically. But I think what is more likely, if there is a new breakthrough, is it will be something else, something that we theorists were not clever enough to think about. And historically, theorists were very rarely as smart as nature. Nature was often much smarter than the theorists who speculate about it. So we should just keep an open mind, and hopefully, we'll find something 
exciting. So I'd like to give a one start, one line start with some theoretical prejudice of all these options. And as always, with a one line summary, there are many caveats, and I apologize about that. I'll highlight some of them later. So this measured mass of the Higgs around 125 GeV is uncomfortably high for minimal supersymmetry and uncomfortably low for strong dynamics, let it be technicolor or something else. And I use the word uncomfortably because it's not really tight, but it is true that this number 125 is on the high side for supersymmetry and on the low side for technicolor. And it's one reason with, I personally think that perhaps the most likely possibility is none of them. Perhaps something else that we were not smart enough to think about. But it's good to keep that in mind. So I'll say more about that soon. But I would really like to start from the beginning. I told you kind of very rapidly where we are. I'd like now to give a summary of where we are and how we got here. And from that, we'll take again the question of where we are heading. So the standard model is extremely successful. It's the most successful model in the history of science. It has many experimental tests with, there's no discrepancy between the standard model and any measurement we know about. So that's great. And that's also bad because we don't have clues to how to go forward. And it has unprecedented accuracy, not all measurements, but some measurements agree, theory agrees with experiment up to 10 significant digits, which is quite impressive. But naturally, we're much more interested in the problems, not in the things we, not in the things we understand. So I classified the problems into more qualitative and more quantitative. So I'll start with the more qualitative questions. Where did the spectrum of particles come from? We have the spectrum of particles, the spectrum of interactions. They come by a gauge group. Why is this the gauge group and not some other group? We have some particles and some representations. Why do we have these representations? And everything comes and repeats itself three times. Why is that the case? The second question is what determines the electroweak scale, the mass of the, Hig the Higgs, the W, and the Z particle? And then come the Yukawa couplings. In the Yukawa couplings, this is where most of the parameters of the standard model are. And that's both a qualitative and a quantitative question. Most of the parameters are here, so for the quantitative questions, we would like to understand where these numbers come from. They determine the fermion masses, the quark mixing angles, CP violation, etc. But there's also a qualitative question here because they span, these are number, dimensionless numbers, and they span about five orders of magnitude. Which it's actually even more than that, and I'll be more specific about that later. And such small numbers raise a big question. Why, where did we have such a wide spectrum of small numbers? And I'll say more about that later. So continuing with the qualitative questions, we have a bunch of hierarchies. The first of them I've already mentioned. This is these five orders of magnitude in quark masses. This is the mass of the electron versus the mass of the top. This is about five orders of magnitude. We also have a pattern of mixing angles in the quarks, very strange numbers. Some of them are extremely small. We don't understand why it is so. This is a question of a different nature, the QCD theta parameter. This is a parameter that measures CP violation in the strong interactions. Experimentally, is less than 10 to the minus 11 in natural units. It's an angle, so they are natural units. It's less than 10 to the minus 11, and the number keeps going down as better and better measurements take place, and I think it's fair to say that we have no idea why the number is so small, and it really asks, begs an explanation. Where did such a small number come from? And finally, I mentioned the electroweak scale and the Higgs mass. Continuing with the questions, it's the dark matter, and the question that is, I, I was actually a little bit imprecise before when I said that there are no discrepancies with this, in the standard model. The whole sector of neutrinos is outside, outside the minimal standard model, it's not a big extension, but it's there. And again, we see a pattern of masses, and we see a pattern of mixing angles. And very importantly, the pattern of angles here is quite different than the pattern of angles in the quark sectors. So it's a whole set of numbers asking for an explanation, and we don't know the answer to that. So I'd like to give this 35-year perspective on that. Again, I said around 1980, this is where I learned 
this subject, which uncovers my age. And I think I was embarrassed to say that all or most of these problems were known in the late 70s. And there's been enormous progress, maybe even more, trying to address these problems, trying to find explanations or models or whatever to explain these uh, facts. Some of the better papers among these hundreds of thousands were written here in Berkeley. So it's an honor to be here and to discuss it. But I think it's still fair to say that despite all this effort, we still have no idea how to answer these questions. Experts in the audience would agree with that. And our best chance, I think, to make progress is not to go after the fancy theories, but to follow the, experiment, the experimentalists. They will give us data very soon, and based on this data, perhaps we'll have some clues how to answer these questions. So that looks very gloomy, 35 years with almost no progress. That's not true. There's been enormous progress during the past 35 years. And in the next few slides, I'll review them. And this will again be a lightning risk. Spend one slide on experiment and one slide on theory. That's not very rapid. So on the experimental side, 35 years, all the parameters of the standard model were measured. They were not known 35 years ago. The mass of the W and the Z, that was in the early 80s. And then gradually all the quark masses, all the mixing angles, and most recently the Higgs mass were measured. A lot of models that people suggested before to explain the pattern of these numbers are already ruled out. They're ruled out because the numbers were measured and they don't fit the prediction of these models. So this is enormous progress. The second line of progress is neutrino masses. 35 years ago, people talked about neutrino masses, but the numbers were not measured. Now we know the masses, we know the mixing angles, and this progress continues, we'll even nail that sector completely, but that goes outside the standard model. We emphasize the enormous progress in cosmology. Part of that was done here at Berkeley, and that's dark matter, dark energy, inflation, Numbers are measured with increasing accuracy. It's really unbelievable and spectacular. If somebody talked about that 35 years ago, as a hope, it would have been sound. It would have, that place person would have looked like he's nuts. How can anybody have these numbers? And now we have all these numbers and there are experiments that will go through. The theoretical side, again, just one slide and then I'll be more concrete. Our, I think on the theoretical front, despite the fact that we have not succeeded to answer these open questions in the standard model, there has been enormous progress. First of all, cosmology, again, this was a backwater 35 years ago. Now it's a precision science with theory, experiments, and so forth, very lively field. This is great. We have much better understanding of quantum field theory, its dynamics, and its possible phases. 35 years ago, Understanding strong dynamics was totally inconceivable. Now it's something that is being done every day. And we have enormous progress in understanding quantum gravity, mostly through string theory and its surprising properties. And the point I'd like to stress here, enormous progress in these directions, we also found very surprising connections between them and surprising connections between them and other branches of science. For example, quantum field theory is related to string theory in many different ways. Also, quantum field theory and string theory have had enormous impact on mathematics. Some fields in mathematics have been completely revolutionized. And historically, whenever there was something like that, it was a sign that both ideas are deep. Again, another example, Descript a progress in quantum field theory that was done within string theory and particle physics had a huge impact on condensed matter physics. I spent this afternoon talking to a condensed matter physicist about ideas that really originated from particle physics in quantum physics sign that we're doing something very deep. My favorite example of that is calculus that was invented for one thing, 
then took a life of its own. It now appears everywhere. So quantum field theory is similar. It's the new language for physics, and that really grew out of the problems in particle physics. And I think we are really only at the beginning of the study of this field. So this, just on the theoretical side, this is a completely sea change since what we had 35 years ago. I would like now to turn to one of the questions that I mentioned before and see and discuss it in a little bit more detail. And this is this hierarchy or naturalness problem. And this is a problem that has occupied physicists in the 20th century. It has been really a theme in 20th century physics. And I'll show some of the giants of 20th century physics who worked on the problem from very different aspects. So dimensional analysis usually works very well in physics. And observables are given usually by some simple order of magnitude dimensional ground computation. And then there's a number of order one. My favorite example of that is that I just throw this pointer up and catch it, and I ask, how high does it go? So on dimensional grounds, it depends on the acceleration, or in this case, it deceleration as it goes up, which is some number, times the time square to get the dimensions right. And then you have to work to get the number of order one out front, which it turns out to be a half. No big surprise. The number of out front would have been 10 to the minus 10, it would tell us that we really, did, we really did the wrong computation because we don't understand what we are doing. This is how dimensional analysis works. And it has been working like that for centuries. And whenever it doesn't work, it's a clue for the next step. So of my list of giants of 20th century physics, these are not all of them, but some of the giants of 20th century physics, I would like to start with Dirac. Dirac had this problem that he called the large number problem. He knew of the Planck scale. It was known from the time of Planck. He knew the proton mass, and he noticed that there are some 19 orders of magnitude between them. If the fundamental parameter of physics is the Planck scale, where did this number of 10 to the minus 19 come from? This was Dirac's problem, and he thought this is a big, a big and deep question. And of course, he was right. Now, today we know the answer to Dirac's question, and that was understood using asymptotic freedom, the strong interactions lead to the mass of the proton. And this ratio is really exponentially small in the coupling constant that is not that small. This is actually the main mechanism, if not the only one, that physicists know how to get very small numbers. You start from a number that is small, but not very small g. You stick it in the exponent like that, and you get a number that is much less than 1. <laughs> well, it's not a joke. It's very serious. This is how BCS theory works. This is how almost everything in physics this is how we get small numbers. And then we feel very satisfied because we fit in this number that is not that small and it manufactures a very, very small number. But as much as we understand the, an the answer to the Ox question, this question has a modern incarnation. So the newer version of the same problem is why the mass of the W, the Z, and the Higgs are small, so much smaller than the Planck scale. And if before we had 19 orders of magnitude to explain, now we have 17 orders of magnitude to explain, and that looks a lot harder. Of course, every problem always looks hard before it's, the solution is found. But this is something that we should really be discussing in more detail. More generally, then, more generally, I'll distinguish between an intuitive hierarchy problem and the, <clears throat> sorry. More generally, this intuitive problem is where did, this small number, where did these small numbers come from? So the next giant of 20th century physics is Weisskopf. Weisskopf studied electrodynamics, and he formulated this rule that there are divergences in quantum electrodynamics. They didn't quite understand the meaning of these divergences at the time. But his rule was that logarithmic divergences, quadratic divergences, is something that we should avoid. In the mass of the Higgs, or the mass of the W, there are some quadratic divergences there, and this is not something we should tolerate. A newer version of the same problem came from Wilson. I'm continuing with this parade of giants. And Wilson understood the connection between quantum field theory, the way it's understood by particle physicists, and the way it's understood by condensed matter physicists. And he understood that a scalar particle like 
The Higgs, if it's light, it's like being very close to a phase transition. So imagine we have a phase transition and we turn a knob in the lab like the magnetic field or the temperature or something. And we come close to tune to be near the phase transition. The 17 orders of magnitude in the mass, actually the relevant thing is the square of that is tuning to be close to a phase transition by 30, one part in 10 to the 34. So that looks insane. We have to tune the knob not to be at the phase transition point. Maybe that's something that we could be happy with, but slightly away, 10 to the minus 34 away from it. So that's again a result of the quadratic divergences, and that was Wilson's view. The next step is Weinberg. Weinberg emphasized that it's not just a question of a number that we don't understand. It's a question of sensitivity. So imagine what we have is something at low energies. And we dial the knob, not at low energies, but at high energies. We control some parameter here, which affects things here. This tuning of one part in 10 to the 34, that tuning an energy scale. So if we change the parameters a little bit at high energies, it has a huge effect at low energies, and it completely destabilizes the hierarchy. This was the point that Weinberg put in, and that shows that the issue has nothing to do with divergences. The issue of this naturalness has absolutely nothing to do with divergences. It is the question of sensitivity to small changes in parameters at short distance or high energy. <coughs> and then steps another giant in, at Hoft, and at Hoft formulated his criterion that the parameter can be small only if the problem becomes more symmetric when it's exactly zero. So if we tune a number to be zero or very close to zero, and the problem is more symmetric at the point where the parameter is zero, that's okay. We can slightly break a symmetry. But if it so happens that we don't get any symmetry and we just tune to 7.5, 3, 12, etc., etc., and then we tune that to 34 decimal points and there is no, this point is not special. That's something that Etoff did not like. And this is the principle that he advocated. And I'll refer to it as technical naturalness. So again, the intuitive problem is where did this small number come from? And the technical one is the issue of the symmetry. So I would like to say it again. The intuitive problem is where did these small numbers come from? Where did these hierarchies come from? This is, again, like doing this experiment and being off by saying that the number is 10 to the minus 11 times 10 to the minus 10 times the expected one. And so where did these numbers come from? Why doesn't dimensional analysis work? And in this case, I would like to say that we can postpone the question, and the question is not immediate. We don't have to address it immediately, but sooner or later, we'll have to answer the question. The technical aspect that was really highlighted more by Toft is a more severe problem. And that is that even if in some approximation we find this tuning, this tuning might be ruined by high order corrections or more put to the point, it can be ruined quantum mechanically. Intuitively, in, we can, in quantum mechanics, everything fluctuates. So this sensitivity to small parameters at short distance that Weinberg emphasized so it's not just, we, we are not allowed to tune very accurately because everything is going to fluctuate all the time and the fluctuations will tend to restore dimensional analysis. I'd like to say it differently because this is a really important point, so it should be said from many different points of view. In classical physics, we can change parameters and two numbers meet, meet and cross. So I change one curve goes here, another curve goes here, and they meet at some point. And I could perhaps tune one number to be near that crossing point. This cannot happen in quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanics, levels usually do not cross. As we change parameters, we say that levels repel themselves. Why is it that this happens? One way of thinking about it is the quantum mechanical fluctuations destroy, but we try to tune the levels together, the quantum mechanical fluctuations destroy. Another way of saying it is if we write a Hamiltonian for this two by two system of the two levels, we have parameter is in classical physics, but three parameters. The Hamiltonian has four numbers for the two level system. And for the two eigenvalues to be the same, we have to tune three of them. So if in cl classical physics, we have to tune one parameter, 
That's something that perhaps we can tolerate. In the quantum theory, we have to tune three parameters, not just one. And that's what makes the problem harder. In this case, we should really be, have to solve the problem at the scale where it arises. So if the first intuitive problem is a problem that we can postpone, and perhaps it happens, the resolution is at much higher energies, the more technical problem has to be solved almost immediately within an order of magnitude uh, or so. So let me go now through the various examples that I mentioned before and, contra and contrast them with this classification. So we talked about fermion masses that they span five orders of magnitude. Here we have only the intuitive problem. If we set all the quark masses to be exactly zero or all the mixing angles to be zero, we gain a symmetry. So Mr. Rithoff would be, that's fine, such a small number I can live with. That's not a problem. That's only the intuitive problem, not the technical problem. And therefore, we can postpone the solution. And indeed, most models that try to address this problem do not necessarily address it at the TV scale, nearby energy, but sometimes at much higher energy. And it's perfectly reasonable that the explanation for why the quark masses are what they are is something that we'll have to wait till we understand Planck scale physics completely. So in this case, we can postpone the in this case, we can postpone the explanation. The second problem of hierarchy that I mentioned is kind of in between. This is the strong CP problem. Here, the divergence is only logarithmic. It's not divergence. Also, for quark masses, it's only logarithmic. And, but again, we don't gain a symmetry when we set it to zero. So I would put it in. So here we have both the intuitive and the technical problem. And indeed, most resolutions of this problem, of this strong CP problem, have immediate low energy consequences. Some class of models suggested the mass of the up quark is zero. Some class of models suggested there is an axiom, which is the light particle. So the question has to be addressed at the energy where we see. There are more elaborate models that solve the problem at higher energies, but they are quite complicated. So I think they could be ignored. So there could be something else, but this is a problem which we have to address, and this is a problem that has to be solved at low energies, unlike the others. Continuing with the list of problems, we go to the Higgs mass. Here we have a quadratic divergence, and here this natural this problem really hits us in the face. From every perspective we look at, this is a problem. We have quadratic divergences. We have sensitivity to high energy physics. No symmetry is restored. I add parenthetically here that the SU2 times U1 symmetry of, electroweak, of the electroweak theory is never really broken. It could be spontaneously broken or not, but it's always an exact symmetry. So in this case, we have the two aspects of the problem, both the intuitive and the technical one, and we have to solve it at low energies. This is what a lot of physicists have been doing for the last 35 years, trying to address this question from many different perspectives. And without, well, we've learned a lot, but there's no gold plate model that really does the job. And the LHC is gradually shrinking the parameter space that is still allowed. And now comes the biggest hierarchy problem, big elephant in the room. And this is the cosmological constant. Uh, it's cortically divergent. So if we had a problem with quadratic divergences, here it's much worse. It's cortically divergent. And here the fine tuning is to 120 orders of magnitude. If before we panicked of over 34 orders of magnitude, one part in 10 to the 34, here we have one part in 10 to the 120. That's really bad. And again, going with my historical perspective, 35 years ago, I remember that very vividly. We thought that the cosmological constant is zero. This is a problem. We don't understand why it is zero. We just have to find some symmetry or something that to make it exactly zero. But one day we'll understand why it's zero. Now, primarily through the work done here at Berkeley, we know that it's not zero. And that made the issue much, much more severe because not only do we need to understand zero, we can imagine that something like zero is a qualitative question. There would be some principle that would set it to zero. Now there's a computation we need to do. We need to do a computation with numbers of order one that the result of the computation will be one, it will be 10 to the minus 120. That's quite a challenge 
and many people tried that, I think there's zero progress here. Given that, I think some of our questions or ideas about naturalness have been shaken. Maybe we were barking up the wrong tree. Maybe that's not the right idea. Maybe we should think of something else. But given that, I would like to review a little bit in more detail what the status of the nat hierarchy problem for the Higgs mass. So I said before that there are two classes of solutions, the weak, weak coupling solution and strong coupling solution. The strong coupling goes under the name of technicolor, the weak coupling goes under the name of supersymmetry. So starting with strong, with technicolor, so the one line summary is that te technicolor is basically dead. In fact, it has already been dead for quite some decades. Precision measurements in the standard model that haven't happened decades ago have already killed it and the mass of the Higgs really I think is the last nail in the coffin. And the, re the reason for that is intuitively clear. If we have, the, once we know the Higgs mass, we know the self-coupling of the Higgs. How strongly does the Higgs couple to itself? And the number 120 translates to a Higgs self-coupling which is small. If there's strong dynamics around, like QCD, every particle in QCD interacts with every other particle very strongly. That's why it's called the strong interaction. It's called the strong interactions because one proton interacts strongly with a pion or with another proton or with a neutron. So the intuitively, strong interactions give us strong couplings, and the fact that we don't have strong coupling, and the Higgs self-coupling is small, really goes against uh, the idea of strong dynamics leading to it. That's what I said earlier when I said that the number 125 is uncomfortably small for strong dynamics, because it means that the self-coupling of the Higgs is uncomfortably small. Now, there are more sophisticated models for Technicolor, which can accommodate a lighter Higgs, but they're incredibly complicated and quite contrived, and I'm not even convinced that they really work. So this is Technicolor. Moving to the weak coupling solution, supersymmetry, and again, I'll give just a one slide summary. It's how to make supersymmetry fully natural also. This thing was motivated by this naturalness problem, but it turns out that it's very hard to make it natural. In a minimal supersymmetric standard model, the Higgs self-coupling, the same number that turns out to be too strong in Technicolor, here it turns out to be too weak. The Higgs self-coupling is tied to the gauge coupling. We know the gauge coupling. So in the tree approximation, the Higgs is less than the Z. That's not true, 125 is more than the Higgs mass. Radiative corrections can lift it up, so it's not totally stupid. <coughs> but in order to lift it up to 125, we need a conspiracy of effects. Every one of them is probably not enough. We need the stop, the super partner of the top to be relatively heavy. We need large A terms, doesn't matter what it is. And we need to go beyond the minimal model. The whole, every one of these possibilities is logically possible and there are models doing it. But the whole thing smells rather problematic. So my summary of that is what I said before. This number 125 is uncomfortably low for one option, uncomfortably high for the other option. And we are kind of stuck in the middle and we have to ask ourselves how to proceed. So what are the options about naturalness in, in the near future? One possibility is that naturalness is correct, the LHC will run and we'll discover some natural version of supersymmetry or maybe some other natural solution of all this hierarchy problem. And hopefully this will happen soon. We're talking about a year or two from today. So that would be very exciting in this option. The alternative, is that physics in the TV range is unnatural. This will be a shock. This will be a shock because this idea of naturalness has been a theme in 20th century physics. Over 20th century physics, and especially during the past 35 years, that's what most people who did phenomenology, model building, and so forth, this was their guiding principle. And given that that was their guiding principle to say that the guiding principle is wrong, that's quite a shock. So and that could happen several different ways. First, it could be just the Higgs and nothing else. It'll measure more and more and there's nothing else. Second, some kind of supersymmetry, version of supersymmetry, more particles are found one way or another, and, but they have nothing to do with the hierarchy problem and the problem is still there. 
In that case, we should really re-examine the question of naturalness. What did we do wrong? What in this whole long chain of reasoning, which really starts with dimensional analysis and level crossing in quantum mechanics and the importance of symmetries and this and that, something here was wrong. We were thinking wrongly about quantum field theory. And as I meant, emphasized earlier, we think we understand quantum field theory now a lot better than 35 years ago. This is the only thing that hasn't changed. Well, there are other things that haven't changed, but this is one important thing that has, hasn't changed. And our experiment could tell us that it's wrong. So I prepared the flow chart for the options to make it easy to remember. So first question, is there something beyond the single Higgs? The answer to that we'll know within a year or two. So option one, nothing beyond the single Higgs, and then we'll have to abandon naturalness. That's, I've already said that. It could be quite exciting if something beyond the Higgs is found. Uh, but then the question we'll have to ask ourselves is, is electric breaking natural or not? And if no, again, we'll have to abandon naturalness. And this is the option I like the most, but it looks less and less likely, is that some new stuff will be found, some new particles, which will explain how electroweak symmetry breaking is natural, and in which case the world is natural in 20th century physics. But you see, it's quite possible that we'll find ourselves here, a logical possibility. So what do we do if the world, if TV physics is unnatural? And the leading option is a landscape of vacua, perhaps even using the A word. This is a very popular topic here at Berkeley, and some of the best papers in the subject were written here by various people. I'll not stop mentioning names because there's so many, I might forget somebody. So the idea is quite familiar. The world is much bigger than we think. It comes under the name of the multi -word, multiverse. Uh, and the laws of physics are different in different places. The laws of physics are environmental. And predicting or explaining parameters of the standard model is like, like the electron mass and all these hierarchies is not a natural question to ask. This is like explaining the size of the orbits of the planet. So again, a historical reminder I'm old, but I'm not that old. <laughs> I wasn't around at the time of Kepler. Kepler is best known for his laws about the motion of the planet. But historically, the law of, that Kepler really liked the most is the law that explains the sizes of the orbits in terms of six planets were known at the time, and there were five platonic solids. So he drew spheres at the radius of the planets, and he inscribed the five platonic solids either inside or outside these spheres and then fit quite nicely. So this was the model he liked. What can be deeper than that? Some deep mathematics that there are five and only five platonic solids is tied to objects in heaven. That's really great, except that, of course, it's completely wrong. First, the numbers didn't fit. And then the planets move on ellipses. He also found that rather than circles. And the real kicker is that there are more than six planets, and there are only five platonic solids. This is actually an interesting lesson to theorists. Beautiful connection to beautiful deep mathematics does not always point in the right direction. Sometimes it does, sometimes it does not. So that's an example. So the conclusion is that that's not a good question to ask, and we should really find the right questions to ask. And in a case like the one we are facing, where naturalness might be wrong, and some things might be environmental, we should ask ourselves, what are the right questions to ask? And this is really challenging and perhaps disappointing. Should we really attempt to solve all, the, all these naturalness problems? The strong CP problem, the fermion masses, the mixing angle. We had a long list of such naturalness problems. Which of them should we solve? What are the right questions? So for the case of uh, Kepler, he understood why these are ellipses. He understood more kind of how fast objects move. He did not explain the initial conditions that set the parameters of the ellipses. And this eventually led to the one over R square force by Newton. Newton understood that that summarizes all the information from Kepler. So we should understand what is it that we should focus on, which is really deep, and what is it that is environmental. I've got to say that I find this very, very disturbing, but it might be true. So what will be the right questions to explore? Someone might say that we should stop looking for deeper truth at shorter distances. 
And this has been a theme in science for the last few centuries, not just the 20th century, for the last few centuries. We always looked for deeper truth at shorter distances that explains facts that we see at longer distances. It comes under the name of reductionism. So we read one distance to what happens at shorter distances. A lot of call of chemistry was explained eventually by the theory of the atoms and molecules and quantum mechanics. Nuclear physics is explained by, first there was nuclear physics, and that was explained by the strong force at shorter distance. And everything, go, we keep going to shorter and shorter distances, and we peel the onion, and we find deeper and deeper truth. But maybe that's not true. And we really reach the point that in this endeavor of several centuries, maybe it reached the end. And if that is the case, this is the end of reductionism. I, again, I say that I feel that extremely disturbing. And if this is indeed the case, I'm going to argue now against it, we have a very strange coincidence. And physicists don't like coincidences. So the first, the first fact is that we are approaching the boundary of our theoretical understanding. It just so happens that until around TV, reductionism works well, and then it stops working around one TV, and at higher energies, it's different. All these parameters are environmental. We think that the mass of the carbon nucleus can be calculated out of QCD, but the mass of bottom quark cannot be calculated from deeper principles. That's the thing, and this happens at around one TV. This is the first funny thing. The second thing that coincidentally happens at the same time, we have a technological, we are approaching a technological barrier in what we can measure. We can envision one more order of magnitude with accelerators. Maybe we'll be creative and we'll get two more orders of magnitude in energy. And maybe, maybe, maybe we'll get three more orders of magnitude in energy. It's totally inconceivable, I think, that we'll get 10 more orders of magnitude in energy. It's not just a question of technology. To explore energy at that range, we need accelerators maybe the size of the solar system. I'm just making the number up. But it's clear that we need something that is well beyond what we can do, both technologically and financially. And it so happens that the theoretical barrier appears at the same time as the experimental barrier. That sounds insane to me. And the third thing that happens at the same time is now. So three things happen. <laughs> three things happen at the same time. And my take on that slide is that maybe this logic here is wrong, but maybe we should not rush into conclusions that this is the way to go. So I try to show both sides of the story, both positive and negative, but I'd like to summarize the conclusions. What can the LHC find? Option one. No discrepancy between the minimal standard model and the data. This is something that we'll know very soon. Alternatively, there could be new physics. New physics, it goes beyond the standard model and can appear either in some discrepancies in some processes, in the branching ratios, production rate, etc., or more dramatically, an actual new particle that will be discovered. And that will have nothing to do with, with the with the stability or the hierarchy problem with the stability of the weak scale, or there could be a natural explanation of the weak scale in the supersymmetry or technicolor or something else that we haven't yet thought about. So I think these are the three classes of things that can happen, either nothing or some discrepancy from the, stand from the standard model that has nothing to do with naturalness or a natural solution. And it will be very interesting one is right, all these options are interesting one way or another. First, they're interesting because they give us correct information. We'll not just stand here and speculate what if it's natural, what if it's not, what if there's this model or that model. We know for sure what's going on. And they also, as I try to highlight here, they point to deep physical principle with very far-reaching philosophical consequences about the universe. I said before, is this the end of the reductionism? Is the world natural? Are these parameters environmental? Is this the end of reductionism or is it not? So we are really in a win-win situation. This is a great thing. Both the null result and the, posit and the positive result both teach us new and deep things. So I think it's very exciting. Some people view the situation as gloomy. I think we are on the verge of a real deep understanding of nature. 
So I think there's no question that the future will be very exciting. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. More questions. Um, practically all of 20th century, 21st century physics is based on the uh, assumption that the speed of electromagnetic radiation is an absolute constant. Experimentally, this is false. So consequently, shouldn't we be looking within the context of Newtonian physics for a new atom to replace the quantum mechanical atom? Maybe we should, but I have nothing useful to say about that. Uh, you uh, mentioned the very big numbers that appear in physics, uh, 10 to the 34, 10 to the 120. Uh, that is disquieting, and it's a little worrisome. Uh, but in the end, uh, I didn't hear a solution uh, for this. Should we just accept that there are big numbers and not worry about it? Well, I, s I presented two options. Option one, we should really think very hard how to explain these numbers, and I'll be delighted to see an explanation. Option one, I tried, many people tried, we got zero. I, zero, zero achievement, not the answer zero. <laughs> it's really depressing. The flip side is maybe this is a clue. Whenever there's a problem that we try to solve one way and we fail, maybe we're thinking about it wrong. Either this is the wrong question, maybe it's environmental and so forth. Some people in the audience are completely sure it's environmental. Or maybe some young graduate students here already knows the answer. And you think about, oh, these old guys, they don't know what they're talking about. He knows how to think about it. She knows how to think about it. So I'm kind of agnostic. I'll be a lot of the rational explanation of these numbers. Okay, can I reply to that? Uh, when I was a student, I learned the charge on the electron. Uh, was uh, 10 to minus 19 in some kind of uh, units. And I never bothered me that it was a small number. I said, that's just part of nature. It's a small number. Uh, why does it bother you so much? Because the mass, the charge of the electron in the units that you describe, are, these are units that are from macroscopic right. experiment. I think Mr. Coulon or somebody started that. If you express the charge of the electron in the natural units, then it's one. And <laughs> well, there's still something to understand because the charge of the quark is a third. Why is it a third here and one there? Well, there's a whole story behind that. And physics is all about explaining numbers. So explaining the ratio of the mass of the charge of the electron to the charge of the quark is an interesting number. Even the fact that it's one is an interesting number. The this is something that really started with the work of Planck, that he decided to pick these natural units. So once you pick the natural units, this is where you should address the question. Alternatively, you can say if you have two constants in nature, like the charge of the electron and the charge of the proton, well, the ratio is to up to the sign is exactly one to one. But imagine this large number that you had 10 to the minus 19, we had one elementary particle with charge 10 to the, we charge one, the electron, and another elementary particle with charge 10 to the 19th, I would say, yes, this is something we should explain. So if an, ex an elementary particle with charge 10 to the 19th is discovered, I think you'll be bothered by that. Wow, where, where did this come from? Well, even in the standard model, it's non-zero. I forget the exact number. Even with the standard model where you compute it, even if you set it to zero, it, it, it slides a little bit away. But the experiment continues to push it down, and I do not know when they will find a non-zero answer. Whatever they will find will be very exciting. We have, from this natural perspective, it's an angle, it could have been pi over four, pi over three, it could have been anything. And the fact that it's so small, it's not unlike the example I gave before of an elementary particle whose charge is 10 to the 19th. That's something that needs to be understood. So here, it's also, there's a number, it's an angle. If it had been 25 degrees, fine, that's what it is. 
but if the fact that it's so small is telling us that we're not thinking right about something, or that we have to fix the standard model, and people have, have suggestions. They are perfectly natural suggestions how to address this question, and experimental searches for the signatures of these suggestions are going on. So far, nothing has been found. Well, is the point zero a special point? Yeah. If it's a special, if zero is a special point, then it's perfectly natural. If if a, the number zero is not a special point, so you can slide it to say, is the answer three point five six three five seven etc. I don't know why that is it. Yeah, that's what the truth said, but it's also clear. You say two numbers are equal. Two numbers are equal if there's a symmetry that makes them equal. If two particles have exactly the same mass, and there's no reason for them to have exactly the same mass, and no symmetry, no real reason, and we measure the mass and it's the same to 34 orders, decimal points, it begs an explanation. talked about how successful the standard model is, but there's one uh, very big fact that it doesn't explain at all, and that's dark matter. Yeah. So we know there are other particles out there, whether we need super super technicolor, we know we have an incomplete answer, and maybe that's the reason we're not able to put all this together. Well, I, that's a clue, and I think dark matter was on my list, and there are searches for dark matter. The windows are gradually closing, but they, they're still allowed windows. I really hope something will be discovered, and it will be very efficient if these dark matter particles, once they're discovered, also play a role in electroweak symmetry breaking. This would be kind of double duty. So they will solve two problems. Maybe this will happen, maybe not, but we should keep a, an open mind. There's no doubt that there's new physics beyond the standard model. Dark matter, and, and not just explaining these numbers, like neutrino masses, uh, the baryon number of the universe. There are all sorts of things, and eventually there's gravity. So there must be new physics beyond the standard model. The only question is, is this Im immediate? I mean, is it in the TV range, something that we can explore now? Or should we wait till, I don't know, several centuries that people know how to explore higher energies? I'd like to hope that we'll know that soon. Could you say something that perhaps the problem with the naturalness, could you say a little bit more about I don't understand the question, I'm sorry. Is, is more, can you say more about, about what naturalist is? Natural is precisely the way I defined it. You gain a symmetry if the parameter is exactly zero or tuned to the value you're interested in, and then the symmetry is violated a little bit if you're a little bit away from that. It has nothing to do with the uh, natural life or a... Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, you were talking about this uh, triple coincidence of technological and understand limitations and, and our understanding in terms of nationalist breaking down. Um, but wouldn't it be fair to say that naturalness has already been under some pressure for some time, long before the LHC was turned on, at least was left to? And so why, I mean, it seems a little like moving the goalposts, right? Why, why don't we count the LHC as a real strike against naturalness rather than, well, now we start being puzzled and unfortunately we don't have another accelerator ready. Well, I, you summarized my talk very well. <laughs> <laughs> In other words, the elite, already at the time of LEP, naturalness was stra strained. And with the LHC, it becomes more severe. And within a year or two, I think, as far as I'm concerned, that would be it. And, but I, when I say now, I mean within our lifetime. You know, people have been doing physics for centuries, and they will continue to be doing physics for centuries. And it so happens now, when, I, when I'm alive, and you can argue whether we're talking about April or March or 2020 or 2000. That's trivial on the scale that we're talking about. 
So that's what I meant by now, within our lifetime. When I studied physics, even when you studied physics, naturalness was the principle, and it's now under stress, and it might be that within a few years, we'll that was wrong. So within a some time scale. And that's more or less where, so that was the now, and then there was the fact that it happens at the energy scale that is being explored here. And again, it could say that it's 100 GeV, or 1 TeV, or 10 TeV. That's negligible on the scale that we're talking about. And the experimental barrier, again, you could say, okay, we had a LEP, and now we have LHC, and then maybe the 100 TeV collider. And maybe people will be very creative and will go to 1,000 TeV. Why did it break here? It could have, naturalist could have broken at 1 electron volt, or could have broken at 10 to the 15th. GeV. Why did it break it exactly here? Now, whenever you make such arguments, it's always soft. It's not a real sharp barrier. But the fact that here we are toward the end, after the end of 20th century, beginning of 21st century, we face today two, bar two other barriers. This more or less the same time. I think it's a sign that there's something that we're not understanding. I think that's clear. Lawrence, yeah. I'm just going to make a comment. I mean, one could say on the cosmological constant that the scale at which naturalness broke down was a milli electron volt. Uh, the cosmological constant is a kind of a different beast here. Your point is well taken. And the cosmological constant is, a, is, a, is of somewhat different flavor than the other naturalness problems. The naturalness problem is really a problem within quantum field theory because this is a framework we understand. We, can, we have a well posed question. In the cosmological constant, we need to bring classical, at least classical gravity into the story. So for that, I think the cosmological constant, this was the excuse I told myself. This is how I rationalized the fact that, well, yes, this is a problem, but maybe there are bigger issues at play here, and I don't understand that. The other naturalness problems are within a framework that we think we really understand. It's within quantum field theory. We don't need to invoke gravity. So, and I can imagine a natural solution for the cosmos. I cannot imagine, but I can hope. That, <laughs> and there's a natural solution to the cosmological constant problem that kicks in, say, uh, 1 TeV or 10 TeV, and makes, through some ratio, makes the cosmological constant small. I don't know what's at play. I do not know what, what the principles are. I do not know how to calculate it. It's quite far-fetched. I agree. But I think the problem with the Higgs is really a hit hitting us in the face, because this is within a framework that we completely understand. Completely understand. There is no wiggle room. But, yeah, when there is something we are not understanding, it's very hard to argue one way or another. It's clear that we are not understanding. Yeah, it seems like the biggest problem with the, uh, the big bang theory is, is where all the antimatter is. And that's uh, often explained as there's almost exactly the same amount of matter and antimatter, except 99.99% of it was uh, annihilated. And um, I don't know, that's, that just doesn't sit well with me. And I wonder your, what your thoughts on that. Well, I thought this is actually, of all the things that I highlighted that we do not understand, I thought that this is something that we do understand. We have various mechanisms for barrier genesis. We need all the elements that are needed in order to create the dis the disparity, and we don't know for sure, there could be one mechanism or another, but there isn't an immediate contradiction there. There isn't really an immediate contradiction. With the mass of the Higgs, I think it's really, really an immediate contradiction, and it's now, and, and we have to face it. The barrier number of the universe could be made at that energy scale or higher energy scale, you could throw in more particles that have no effect at the experimentally today that would fix that problem. There's really no immediate contradiction. With the Higgs mass, I think there is. I have a question. Um, perhaps we need really more new experimental inputs. Should we be looking for new ways of doing experiments that will give us the insight into my physics that are not real accelerators, perhaps? Yes. <laughs> well, don't, look, don't look at me. Look at the younger people in the audience. Okay, let's uh, thank you.
Thank you.